All right. Well, um, how many of you uh, have ever been to Top Golf in Tampa? Man. Okay, so here's the Top Golf is when you're going on I 75 and you look off to the left when you first get into Tampa, you'll see what looks like a stadium with a gigantic net. That is a stadium where you hit golf balls and it's all electronic. You hit targets and all this stuff, and they got food, and it is just an absolute blast to go to. Now, I went there a few weeks ago because uh, the association that we're a part of uh, paid for uh, a bunch of us pastors to get together, opportunity for uh, us to meet, encourage young pastors. I was like the second oldest guy there, okay? So, um, yeah. I'm not sure how to take all that applause, quite frankly. And... Uh, and so we're all hitting and meeting people, and, and, uh, and matter of fact, is, is, Arosa, is Rosa and Cassidy here tonight? Maybe they didn't make it because of the rain, but I met her uh, cousin there. Just had a great time, and we get, we get to the end, and the guy that, that uh, put it all together and organized it, you know, they'd been taking pictures the whole time, and he, and he comes up and he goes, hey, give me your Instagram account so I can go ahead and, 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 uh, and hit you up in it so that, you know, we can get this out there. And I looked at him and I was, it was a really awkward moment for me. <laughs> and I said, I don't have an Instagram account. But a lot of you know I do have an Instagram account. But I don't use my Instagram account. And it was one of those moments where I was like, okay, now I'm really looking old. <laughs> right? Now I'm really looking at it. So why, why was I so uncomfortable in that moment? Well, I sat down actually with staff not that long ago and talked about the fact that something had cropped up in my life that had been in there in the past and had been dealt with. But when I would get into Instagram, which by the way, I, I know a lot of you guys are on it. A lot of you guys have no issues with it. You know, I follow hot rod builders, motorcycle builders, metal fabricators, you know, industrial uh, design, all kinds of stuff like that I was following. But the, the difficulty, which I had known before, didn't think about it when I got back into it, is how many times next to that cool motorcycle that has been fabricated, they've got a woman with it. And, and at first it's like, yeah, they all do that. And you know, just, just looking past it, looking past it, looking past it. And then I notice that they actually start to name names. Oh yeah, we want to thank so-and-so for posing with the motorcycle. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And start to look at, see, does she pose with other motorcycles? Awkward moment, isn't it? And I sat there and I went, this isn't good for me. Like, a lot of people can handle Instagram. I can't handle Instagram. A lot of people can handle, I, now Facebook is not an issue for me. Facebook, I really feel like I, I, that one has never been a problem for me. But Instagram is so visual and I'm such a visual person that it really began to cause some problems for me. So I, I, I shared with the staff how I, have to, how I had to unplug. I don't have Instagram on my phone. I, the, the account exists, but it was, it was, it was the, the phone access and the availability of it that was always just causing me an issue. And, I, and, and you go, well, what, what, how does that all happen? What do you do when something that you thought you were over with pops up again? Or what do you do if you feel like you're stuck in something? Or what do you do when you feel like there's something in your life that isn't healthy, that you know is, is really harmful to you? Or, and, or, or something that, that you're doing and nobody else knows that you're doing it? How do you break free from it? Because here's what, one of the things I love about our Lord, is man, he loves us so much, he just doesn't let us keep going. Right? He doesn't let us keep going. And so, so I want to walk with you through uh, a, a great illustration of how do you walk out of those things when you found that you've gotten stuck in it? How do you walk out of something that trips you up? How is it that you can get that in the past and be able to let God do something in your life? Because here's what I believe. Listen, and I'm talking as a guy. So guys, let's just talk as guys, okay? Every dude deals with lust. Every dude deals with lust. I mean, maybe you don't deal with lust. I have never met a guy who doesn't deal with lust. We all deal with lust. As a matter of fact, women deal with lust. And, and there's all kinds of different lust. There's lust for sex, right? 
Sometimes there's lust for power. There's lust for money. There's lust for relationships. You ever know somebody that they just can't be alone? They are a serial relationship person. Like they can't be alone for very long. Their breakups last maybe a week and they're on to the next thing. You can, you can have, there's a lot of things that can cause us to lust. We can, we can lust after drugs. We can lust after food. We can, there's a lot of things. It's, it's, it's that inordinate, that what, is, what should be a normal appetite but becomes corrupted. There's an exploitation part of it that's involved with it. And so tonight, I'm going to be really frank and honest with you guys. And here's why. Because I believe that God wants all of us to walk in freedom. I believe that God wants every single one of us to experience the spirit of God moving with power in our lives. And sometimes we're not there because we're not really paying attention to what it is that God is trying to do in our lives. And so there's a situation where King David, if you, if you know the story, King David um, was a little bit tired. He decided to stay home. And while he's staying home, while the other kings are going off to war, he's walking around on a roof to, or on a palace, and he sees a woman named Bathsheba taking a bath on the roof of her home. And he says to his guys, hey, go get her for me. They go get her. She comes to David. She and David, they get busy. She gets pregnant. David tries to cover up what happened by calling her husband, who was a faithful follower of his. Gets him from the battlefield. Says, hey, man, it's been tough out on the battlefield. I want you to, listen, let's have a few drinks. Let's kick back. You deserve a little R&R. He gets the husband drunk, and the husband won't go and sleep with his wife, which is what David is trying to get him to do, because if he can get him to sleep with his wife, it covers up the pregnancy, and he won't go home and do it. He's, he, 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 he can't get himself to do it. And other times David tries to get him to do the same thing. He can't. He can't get himself to enjoy the pleasures of home while his men are on the battlefield. He displays honor like time and time again. So finally David contacts his soldier on the field, his commander named Joab, and says, hey, do me a favor. You guys go ahead and you attack this wall where our enemies are. When you guys get real close, I need you to pull back so that he's exposed. And he's like, it'll look like an accident. It'll look like a, just a, he was killed in action. Every, everything will be fine. That happens sometime April-ish, May. David just goes on and, and, uh, and, he, and he, he's, 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 he's acting like nothing happened. And God sends a guy named Nathan his way. Nathan says, hey, man, I got this problem. I'm, I just can't figure out what to do. And David says, well, what is it? He goes, there's this dude who's like got everything anybody could ever want. His friend comes in from out of town to visit, and he's like, man, I need to kill an animal to, so that we can have a roast, but I don't want to kill any of my animals. And he goes and he steals this poor man's lamb, the lamb that this man loved. It was, a, he just, it was like a pet to him, like a person in his household. And he takes the lamb and he slaughtered it and they roasted it and they ate it. And I, I'm not sure, what do you think we should do with that guy? David is furious. And he goes, kill him. What's there to think about? Needs to be put to death. Can't believe somebody would be like that. And Nathan goes, oh, because you're the guy. <laughs> and, then he, and then the words of God come out. And, he, and basically God says, I've given you everything. I've made you king. You, you, you have everything you could ever want and more. And yet you took Uriah's wife. And you had him killed. And David says, I've sinned. And it's interesting because the next thing that comes out of Nathan's mouth is the Lord has forgiven you of your sin. Now, it didn't mean that the consequences of sin had gone away. And David experiences actually relief that the gig is up. He doesn't have to hide anymore. And he, and he actually wrote two different psalms, which is kind of a strange thing to do. He wrote Psalm 51. I don't know if you would write a psalm about your worst failure, your worst day. I don't know how that would look as a song in your life, 
right? I mean, if you break up from Taylor Swift, you're gonna become a song. She'll make you, she'll find something to sing about you. But nobody sings about themselves and goes, I really blew it, it was terrible. You know, nobody does that. But, but by the Spirit of God, David writes about what had happened. And, and, and I love what he wrote in Psalm 51 because Psalm 51 really gives us the steps of how do you break free? How do you, how do you interrupt that pattern and make room for God to break that pattern for you? And so we're gonna walk through that together as we walk through Psalm 51. We're actually gonna read uh, through different sections of it and, and then I'm gonna give you the step that we can draw from each one of these sections. So David, by the way, not only this, but Psalm 32, I think is the other one that, that is often connected with this. But Psalm 51, look at the introduction. For the choir director, a Psalm of David regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. How is that for an introduction, right? Can you imagine if that's how we did worship on Sundays? And yet David's like, I'm not hiding it. I'm not hiding it. So here's how it begins. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, which I love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Now this version, the New Living Translation, says it differently than uh, New International Version. There are different words for sin. They all mean the same thing, but they all are a little different. Some of the words that you'll see in the Old Testament for sin is, number one is iniquity. Iniquity has to do with the twistedness of our character that we would want corrupt things. It has to do with a bent that we have. The other word is sin. That, that, that's pretty straightforward. The other one is transgression. Transgression means, God, you clearly said it was wrong. You clearly drew a line, and I stepped over the line. I transgressed what you said. Those are different words for sin. He, he says, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion, it haunts me day and night. He, he says this, this is kind of strange, he says, against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Hold it. What about Uriah? Didn't you sin against Uriah? What about Joab, the commander that you gave the order to to withdraw so that Uriah could be killed? Did you not drag him into your little game? What about all the others that you pulled the wool over their eyes? What about all the people that believed in you? What about all the people that looked to you? Did you not sin against them? And, and really, this is kind of a, a, an important understanding. Ultimately, all sin is against God. What he did to Uriah, did he sin against Uriah? Yes, but it was a sin against everything that God is about. It is a sin against life that God created. It was a sin against all the, 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 the kingdom that God wanted to reveal through David. And ultimately all sin, whenever there's an exploitation of another human being, whenever there's an abuse of another human being, Whenever there's a taking advantage of another human being, yes, you've sinned against them, but you've sinned against almighty God, the creator of everything. And ultimately, he's the one that you, you answer to. He's the one that's watching this happen. And he's basically saying, God, I, I, I didn't pull the wool over your eyes. I can't. Against you, and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight when nobody else could see what I was doing. And he says, you will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb 
teaching me wisdom even there. Some versions will say, you desire truth in the inmost parts, which I love. And it's, and it's not just that, listen, he doesn't just desire truth in the inmost parts, he will demand it. Because he knows that if you don't step into truth, you'll never find freedom. And that if you don't step into truth, the darkness can capture your soul. So what do you do? Step one, you gotta learn to just begin by agreeing with God through confession. David says, you're right. You're right. What you say about that, you're right, God. And I, I have blown it. And confession is, is the most freeing, most beautiful, most important step that you can take. Remember, confess means to say the same thing as con, with, fess, speak. I speak with you about that issue, God. I confess. And David confesses it. Why? Because he... He's beginning to step into truth. He's so tired from living the lie. When you read Psalm 32, he says, when I kept silent, when I tried to hide my sin, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer, your hand was heavy upon me. So there's a sense of relief for him. Step one, you've got to agree with God. You've just got to say it's wrong and you've got to say it to him. And you've, no playing games, no hiding, no, none of that. David, in, uh, in, in Psalm 51, in verse seven, he continues with this. Check it out, he says, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. That, that's a sense of shame. When you've done something and, and you knew better, especially when you knew better, the result is a sense of shame that goes with the guilt. It feels like a stain on you. And I love this. Check this out. He says, Cre let's say this together, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Stop there. Renew in me, renew in me a, a, a loyal spirit. There, sometimes, you know, we go through periods of time, especially when, when sin is first creeping in, where we don't sense the distance that's happening. We don't sense the the fact that my conscience doesn't bother me about this like it should. We kind of just begin to wander away and it's so easy sometimes to stray. And David is coming to grips with his own heart. And he's saying, I know my heart, God. Like I could tell you to forgive me and I could go back and do it all over again. God, I want you to give me a loyal spirit. A loyal spirit to sustain me. God, and, and he's asking God to do something deeper in his heart. Hang on to that. We're gonna come back to it. He then says, do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. In the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon people and God could put them on this one like Saul. And when Saul uh, continually rebelled against God, he lifted the Spirit off of Saul and that was the end of Saul. In the New Testament, the Spirit isn't on you. The Spirit comes where? In you. It's different. And, 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 it, and, it's, it, and it's like crazy how God stays with you in it. And when you look at 1 Corinthians, and he's talking about when you sleep with the prostitute. And he says, don't you know that you're joining Christ to the prostitute? In other words, the Holy Spirit ain't leaving you. He's with you in it. Because he's not leaving you. So the spirit is in you. But David, back then, the spirit could be removed and he saw it happen to Saul and he's like, God, don't take your spirit from me. God, don't, 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 don't give up on me. Don't banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. What do we learn from this section? Step number two, address the root, not just the fruit. He's talking about his heart. He's talking about God, I need more than just stopping the behavior. 
there's a reason this looked like a good idea to me. And I'm really concerned about that. You see, it's one thing to, to stop. It's one thing to, to stop what you're looking at. It's one thing to stop what you're drinking. It's one thing to stop what you're shooting. It's, it's one thing to, to, to stop what you're doing. It's one thing to stop the behavior, but if you don't address the root, it's still there. There's something, matter of fact, in Alcoholics Anonymous, when somebody stops drinking, but they still are crazy in how they act and react to people, and the way they treat people, we call them a dry drunk, right? Their families are like, yeah, they stopped drinking, but they're still crazy. Why? Because they're not actually dealing with what was driving the drinking in the first place. You've got to address the root, not just the fruit. You've got to take a deeper look at David saying, God, I need you to do something in my heart. It's not enough for me to stop. Can you imagine being in a support group with David? Well, what's your addiction? Oh, I keep killing guys to sleep with their wives. <laughs> yeah, I'm David. That's me, you know. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, I, I need more than to just stop my behavior. I need God to do a work in my heart. I don't just need to address the fruit. I need to find the root of this. Guys, a lot of people never get there. And I believe God wants us all to be able to get there. Amen. When there's a stronghold in your life, what happens is the root of that, the reason that there's a stronghold is if you trace it back, you'll discover what it is that drives it. Carlos Whitaker, I mentioned him one time before, a worship leader, a very prolific, tremendous influence, almost lost everything because of an addiction to pornography. And he was very open about this at a conference I went to. He wrote a book called Killing the Spider. And he said, you know, what happens is you see spider webs everywhere and you go and you clean out the spider webs. You go, okay, that took care of it. Next day you come back, there's another spider web. You go, okay, clean out the spider web, take care of it. He goes, no, kill the spider! Right, he said, so the, 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 the spider, he says, is an agreement that you made with a lie. The cobweb is the medicator that brings false comfort to that lie. There's a lie that you believe that drives the thing that you're doing. What was David's lie? Well, by this time, David would have been 50 years old. <laughs> He had beat Goliath, won a lot of victories. But he was getting so tired that at this point when he would normally be going out to war, when kings go out to war, as 2 Samuel 11 says, he decided to, I need a break. And, and while he's there in his palace, it wouldn't be that far of a stretch for David to go, I think my best days are behind me. Just don't have the energy that I used to. Hmm. Man, these young guys, I still think I could take these young guys. And in a moment of believing a lie that his best days were behind him, he now sought something to validate, to medicate the lie, to prove that he still had what it took, that he could still be young. Wouldn't be that hard. We call that a midlife crisis today, right? Happens all the time. Because there's a lie that, that, that you believe. Sometimes the lie is nobody will ever want to be with me. And so we medicate by going from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship. I give myself away. I give myself away. I, you give yourself away to people who don't value you. And even though it leaves you feeling empty, you do it because it's at least medicating the lie. The lie that, I, that, I'll, that I'll never have enough often drives people to work and work and work and work. Sometimes there's a grieving that has to happen, and the lie is if I stop and I grieve and I feel my feelings, I'm going to break into a million pieces and there's going to be nobody to pick me up. And so I'm going to work, and I'm going to be productive. 
As long as I work and 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 I work, I don't have to feel. And it's medicated. You see, there's all kinds of, of things that can become strongholds for us. The pastor's lie. You know what a pastor's lie is? Your worth is equal to the platform upon which you stand. Listen, when, we, when, when I meet pastors, my heart breaks. I cannot tell you how many pastors will blow smoke because they're hoping for some form of validation. And, and, they, and they talk a big game, and I sit there, and sometimes, and honestly, I, the group I am probably the most uncomfortable around are pastors. Isn't that weird? Because they have such a hard time saying, I'm struggling, man. I love pastors who go, I'm struggling, man. I'm like, so am I. Let's get together. Let's pray for each other. Let's, let's, let's figure it out together. I, I, love, I love that. So many times, people, instead of being developed, want to be discovered. Because they think that their worth is tied into how many people look up to them and admire them. Guys, this is all a part of, these are all spiders. These are all spiders. And he says, God, I need you to do a work in my heart because there's a twisted bent in me. God, I need you to do a work in my heart. I want you to create in me a clean heart, God. I want you to renew a loyal spirit within me. I want you to forgive me, but I need you to do a work in my heart. I need a new heart, God. I need, I need, I need you more than anything else. Ephesians 5.18, many of you know this passage. It says, do not get drunk on wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And a lot, a lot of times you go, oh, that's cool. I don't, I don't drink anymore, I'm good. Or I don't do that drug anymore, I'm good. Or I don't do that, I don't look at that stuff anymore, I'm good. That's half a verse. <laughs> this is really important. Listen, stopping the behavior alone is not what Christ came for. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do we have Ephesians 5.18? Can you put that up there? It is. Oh, it's behind me. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Let's read it together. Do not be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. It's not saying you're responding to a worship team. It's saying this is living in you because the Spirit is now the one controlling your heart. It means, listen, it means this. You don't settle for stopping the behavior that's the fruit. What you want to do is you want to let the Spirit of God have your heart. You want to let him create in you a new heart, a clean heart. You want to let him re re renew in you a loyal spirit so you don't keep wandering away. You say, God, I need, I need some traction. I, I really want to stay. I don't want to fall again. And you got to address the root, not just... The fruit, God did not send Jesus so you could keep a lid on your sin. He came so you could have freedom. Yeah. And you know, you know that God has your heart when those songs, when those spiritual thoughts are flowing from within you and it's happening. That's why, by the way, being in a spirit, what I call a spirit-saturated environment like this is so important. Sundays, too. I was, I was laughing, Pastor Luke, 
uh, when I preached last week, he's like, man, I got a whole sermon. I was like the whole time just taking notes and stuff. And what happens is when you're in a spiritual saturated environment, it happens when he spoke. I already know what I'm speaking on this Sunday because of what he said. When I'm at Church of Motion, I sit there and I'm standing up and I'll be like, oh, I hope they don't think I'm texting. I'm like getting downloads like crazy from God because it's a spirit saturated environment. Man, you know when, the, when you're being filled with the spirit, when God is directing your thoughts, directing your desires. That's the end game. It's not to stop the behavior. It's to be filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit. See, to get there, you've got to address the root, not just the fruit. He goes on to say this in verse 12. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. It's amazing. When sin gets a hold, you lose your joy. You lose the joy of your salvation. As a matter of fact, if you sin long enough, God will literally become unreal to you. In the back of your mind, you'll know that he exists. But it will seem like he's totally out of the picture, even though he's right with you in it. You actually won't be able to perceive him or sense him. When, you, when God has said to your conscience, stop, and you continue to do Instead, you're training yourself to not be able to hear his voice. Because you're saying, la, 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 la. And all of a sudden, you, then you pray and you say, God, I, I'm really in trouble. I, I really need, and it's like, even if God is speaking, you've trained yourself not to hear. And so, so you, you gotta call out to him. And this is, this is really good, guys. So he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. By the way, the word repent in Hebrew means return. It means to go back to God. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God who saves Forgive me for killing and destroying you who rescue. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. I love what he says there. So step three, what do you do? You gotta share your story. He says, God, restore to me that joy and I'm gonna teach your ways to other people who are also doing what I was into. I'm gonna help other people find freedom, God. I'm gonna lead them to you. I'm gonna let them know that you are a God who forgives, that you're a God who saves. And no matter what it is that you've done, and listen, some of you here tonight may go, yeah, you're, and, you, and you just disqualify yourself time and time and time again from the grace of God because you are sitting in a seat of judgment that you think is higher than God's seat. Now listen, you don't outrank God, and by the way, my guess is, is no matter how bad you are, you didn't use your resources to have someone murdered so that you could sleep with their spouse and then bring other people into the cover-up. Now, maybe you did. I'm glad you're out on bail. It's good to have you. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the fact that David is writing this matters. Because when you disqualify yourself from the grace of God, you've got to look at worse sinners and realize, man, if God forgave him and if he experienced restoration, guess what? You're not too hard of a case for God to do the same for. He'll do it for you too. And so it says, God, I'm... I'm going to tell my story. Because when they hear what I did, that's why this psalm exists, by the way. When they hear what I did and what you did for me, people are going to come to you. People that thought they were disqualified. People that thought, no, I did it again when I knew I shouldn't. They're going to know the door's still open. And you gotta share your story. The power of small groups, you guys. 
is being with other people where you can share your story, the power of being in recovery, the power of being in his girls, the power of, of getting together with other people, even, even over coffee, and just sharing your story. I'm telling you, there is a freedom that happens when you share your story. Can I tell you, there's a freedom I experience. You, I, listen, some people would have gone, a pastor's gonna go up there and talk about lust? Listen, I'm gonna be 55, I'm not dead. <laughs> okay? And guys, guys were guys, right? And here's the deal. There's a freedom. There's a freedom about being able to share this. There's a freedom. Am I worried about judgment? Not at all. I'm really only concerned about what God thinks. And I'm, and, and, there are, listen. I am concerned about what you think, but not before what God thinks. When I, do, when I respond to God according to what God thinks, everything else is gonna fall into place. So, you know, you gotta be careful how you interpret that because some people act like, you know, oh, I don't care what people think. And it's like, no, you really need to. Because sometimes you're a jerk, really. And you're offensive. And you wonder why you don't have any friends. Start paying attention, okay? I won't name any names on that one. <laughs> so share your story, and it, and it gets better. Guys, this, I love this. Check this out. He goes on to say this. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. In other words, if there was any other way I could deal with this, if I could just bring you an animal and say, God, Here's my offering, God. Here's the check. I put it in the drop box. We're good, right? I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. Now I'm going to tell you something. Scholars argue about these last verses because they go, it doesn't fit. Here's what it says. Look with favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be, again be sacrificed on your altar. I think it fits really well. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But here's the fourth step. And here's what he's modeling here. Be courageous, stay vulnerable. This is where the good stuff happens. Be courageous, stay vulnerable. That's where the good stuff happens. <coughs> Be courageous, stay vulnerable. That's where the good stuff happens. He says, God, you value more than anything a broken and repentant heart. You will never reject it. It's what you value. And so, God, I'm going to stay there. I'm going to stay there. I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to be vulnerable. Listen to what Brene Brown says. Brene Brown is just such an amazing author she talks a lot about authenticity. She said, authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen. She goes on to say this, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. Nothing good happens when a mask is being worn. Nothing good happens. You feel disconnected from people when you do that. Nothing, what, what do we say? You're as sick as your secrets. You're only as sick as your secrets. Vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. So, so, so David says, you will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Look on favor with, on Zion, on the nation of Israel, and help her. Rebuild the walls of of Jerusalem, and I think what was going on here was David understood full well that sin at the top affects everything beneath him. I think he understood full well that God could 
punish a whole nation for the wrongs of a king. I think David understood full well that his actions were bound to have an effect on other people. And listen, no sin that you do is ever in private. It always affects others. It always does. Whether it's the person being exploited or the people that you withhold yourself from, the people that don't get you, they don't get your heart because you're so busy hiding behind something or you're so afraid of feeling your feelings that you put on a mask so everyone looks like, hey, it's great. And they don't get you either. They don't, it's like you don't, nobody gets to experience you. But the good stuff happens. He says, look on favor with Zion and help her. I, you know, there's a proverb that says, like a city whose walls have fallen down is a man who has no self-control. And I think David was realizing, I have put this entire nation in jeopardy. Because of my hiding from you, my disconnect from you means I'm not listening to you and there's something really important that you may be trying to tell me that will benefit everybody else. And I think David really appreciated it. He says, look, on, look with favor on Zion and help her rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. God, don't let the decisions I have made impact other people in a bad way. God, I need you to help me. I need you to do what only you can do. And he says, then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit. I don't have to be fake anymore. Nobody has to pretend. Nobody has to come to you with sacrifices and acting all pious. But we get to be real because that's what you value. Are people who are real with their struggles, real with what they're going through. God values your brokenness. He values your sorrow. And he says, then you will be pleased with those sacrifices offered in the right spirit. Then bulls will again be sacrificed on your altar. And see, he's able to know that there's another chapter, right? When, when you stay in a place where you're courageous and you're vulnerable, that begins a new chapter. Most people don't get there. What a lot of people will do is they'll go, well, I'm excited about the next chapter. Yeah, that's all over with back there. And nothing has changed about you. But you hope that by posting it, you hope that by declaring it, you hope that by, by putting it out there that it looks like you're on to a next chapter, guess what? You haven't left the last chapter yet because you've never been broken and you've never come to grips with why you were doing what you were doing. You've never gotten down to the root. And so what's gonna happen is you're just gonna repeat the chapter again. This is where the good stuff happens, you guys. When you are vulnerable, when you are honest, it breaks the stronghold that the devil has. It breaks the power of shame. Jesus said this. He said, whoever comes into the light comes into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what has been done has been done through God. He said, but there are those who won't come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. There's something powerful about when you take the, the, the weapon out of the enemy's hand and you say, you actually can't hurt me with this because I'm going to choose to hurt myself. I'm going to actually make myself vulnerable and expose myself to judgment and criticism and pain. But man, this is the way to freedom. And I am going to trust my God in all of it. There's something powerful that happens and freeing that happens. And for some of you, listen, for some of you, it's hard to get there because anytime you've been vulnerable, you've been stepped on, you've been hurt, you've been stabbed in the back, somebody else has gone and, and talked about it. And so there's something inside of you that says, there's no way I'm ever gonna be vulnerable like that. And I'm telling you, the good stuff happens when you choose to simply Tell the truth. To take that thing and say, God, man, I blew it. God, I've been blowing it. God, I don't want to live a lie. God, I don't want to pretend. There's something powerful that happens when you begin to take steps out into the light. 
And, and, and you go, well, okay, so what happened in David's case? Let me tell you what happened in David's case. Now, he did have to deal with the consequences of his decisions. We know that. God doesn't take away the consequences. Once we tip over the dominoes, the dominoes will fall even when you're forgiven by God. The dominoes will still continue. You'll still have to serve your sentence. You'll still have to pay the fine. You'll still have to deal with the people you've hurt. You'll still have to do all that stuff. That's, that's a part of life. Consequences don't go away. But because of David's willingness to be open and to lay it before God, the golden age of the nation of Israel began to dawn, and it came through his son Solomon. And Solomon, his son, through the woman Bathsheba, became the leader of Israel, brought Israel, the nation, to a place of its greatest prosperity, its greatest influence, its greatest peace, everything. It was the golden age. And I don't think that that could have happened if David had not gotten himself before the true and living God and said, God, I've blown it. I need you to create in me a new heart. I need you to do something in me, God. And, and if he hadn't been courageous and he hadn't stayed vulnerable, I'm telling you, I don't think Solomon would have been able to do what God did through Solomon. And so here's what I can tell you. The best is yet to come. When you're willing and courageous enough to be vulnerable. When you're willing to say, God, I need to lay this down, or God, there's something in me. I don't even know what it is. I don't even know what the root is, but God, I want you to show me the root, because God, I'm so tired of the fruit. There's something that begins to happen when you begin to agree with God and step into a place called truth. Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. The sun will set you free, but the place, the intersection where that happens is always truth. It's always truth. And when you step into that place, healing can begin to happen. God can begin to take the pain of your life, and when you begin to share your story with other people, he can begin to set them free. He can give people hope who felt like there was no hope. He can help people find freedom where they thought there was nothing but chains. For people that bought into the lie, I'm always gonna live with this in my life. When you begin to share your story, you can be free. Guys, lust does not have to rule our hearts. It doesn't. There's a, your heart, my heart, was made for the filling of the Holy Spirit where God can put in you a song, God can put in you a word, God can put in you insight, wisdom, where God can do things in you that are just unbelievable. God wants to do that. We're all created for it. It doesn't matter what our lust is, ladies, guys. There's a place that God has for all of us in a connection with him that is so intimate and so powerful that it is un. Deniable. I'm going to ask the band to come out, and here's what I want to do. Maybe tonight, listen, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. I want to open this space up tonight. And whatever it is that you go, God, I, I need to take this to you. I, I don't even know what's, what, where the brokenness is coming from, but I want your spirit to be my counselor tonight, God. I want you to show me. Or maybe you're going, God, I, I haven't been able to break free from this relationship because I'm so afraid of being alone. But I know this relationship is so toxic. God, I don't want to keep living like this. I want you to enter into this. God, it's wrong. I'm agreeing with you. It's wrong. It's harmful. It's painful. I hurt myself. I hurt other people. And God, I need a new heart. Then tonight, this is for you. You may be coming up just because you're carrying somebody, a friend, that you go, man, this, I wish they were here tonight, and you, maybe you're gonna intercede for them. Bottom line is, I don't want people worrying about what anybody else thinks. Tonight, the only thing that matters is God wants you to be free. That's all he wants for all of us, for all of us. And this is a place where we can do it. The kingdom of God is the most beautiful, big 12-step recovery program in the universe. 
But the goal isn't to stop the behavior. The goal is to let God fill your life. And maybe you go, I'm not into any sin, but man, my heart is so cold when it comes to God. It just seems like I'm going through the motions. And God, I want you to restore to me the joy of my salvation. God, I need a fresh fire. I need a fresh touch from you. Lord, I want to I wanna experience you. I want to feel you. I want to sense you. God, I believe in you. And I need to know you in a way that will absolutely revolutionize the way I relate to you. And so as we worship, this is all open. Whatever it is you feel led, you just feel free in all of it. And I'm going to pray, and we're just going to let God begin to, to minister into it. When we get to the end, I'm going to pray over everyone, and, uh, and we're just going to see where the Spirit takes us with this. So, Father God, thank you so much for the freedom that you desire for all of us. Thank you for your freedom to me. Thank you for your freedom, God, that you want to speak over every life. And, God, we don't, we don't want to just go through the motions we don't want to just offer sacrifices. God, we want to experience what it is to worship you and to know you in the right spirit, filled with your spirit. So God, tonight, we just pray tonight, break chains. God, break strongholds. God, bring down walls. Bring vulnerability. Bring love. Bring your spirit, God, in a powerful way. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said?